Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us this afternoon. This is our Alive and Cable Bahamas Business Solutions Think Beyond seminar. The discussion this afternoon is Pioneers in Technology, Digitalization, and Technological Advancements and its impact on the business community. In our panel this afternoon, we have with us Charnette Thompson, Director of Business Solutions. We have Mr. Franklin Butler, who is our Executive Vice President. We have Senator James Quazy Thompson, Minister of State for Grand Bahama Island and Finance. And of course, we have Damien Blackburn, our Chief Executive Officer at Alive. Thank you so much for being here with us this afternoon. Can everybody hear me? Yes. yes. Thank you. Good awesome. afternoon. Now, in terms of a call for our time, we know that Minister is extremely busy and he has to leave to go back to the house. So Minister, we will jump right in with, quest with a first question for you. Are you ready? Absolutely. Awesome. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you. So Minister, can you tell us some more about the government's past and future initiatives in relation to technological advancements? Absolutely, I'll be happy to. The government through the Department of Transformation and Digitization has been very focused on a couple of initiatives uh, for digital transformation. One of the first things is we recognize that we needed to improve and to expand and increase the amount of online services. And so recently, uh, the government signed a, a $30 million investment loan with the IDB for digital transformation. And included in that process was the goal to provide 200 services online over a five-year period. And we know that that's an ambitious goal, but it, we believe it's one that's achievable. So the government has started um, that process through its mypilotservices.gov.bs uh, initiative. We patented this platform after the Estonia uh, X Road platform, and, and we call ours the Great Bahama Bank. But the principle is the same, that we wanted to have one government platform that had one uh, government portal that would allow citizens to be able to access uh, services in one location, but not just access those services. We wanted them, th those services to be connected so that it would stop persons from having to present things like a passport or national insurance to verify who you are at every single government agency, but that you can sign in you can verify, and then you can go ahead and access all of the different services. So the My Pilot Services has been launched. We are inviting Bahamians to go ahead and take advantage of it. Uh, you now can, uh, can uh, access the applications for a marriage certificate. You could access services for a birth certificate. Uh, the most popular one has been to access for renewal of a driver's license. And we recently added one for the police certificate. So you can, from the comfort of your home, apply and pay for uh, those kind those services. And we also have the electronic passport renewal, which again has been hugely popular. And we've seen Bahamians have been able to utilize this. And it has almost eliminated those long lines that uh, we saw at the passport office. We also have seen initiatives like the food program where persons are able to apply through the national uh, food distribution program. They actually can apply for those services online. The Ministry of Education has been doing a lot of work through its e-learning program, digitizing uh, and, and also with your assistance, uh, Cable Bahamas' assistance with digitizing and providing the necessary cable for our uh, high schools and primary schools throughout the country. Uh, our small home repair program, you've seen uh, persons have, are no longer gonna have to line up in order to get these kinds of services, but we made it possible for persons to be able to actually apply online to get the 
uh, small home repair services. Uh, we've seen the social services. That's that's another initiative that um, we've been working on where uh, very shortly, we believe within this month, uh, the for the first time, persons are going to be able to apply for social services assistance online, which again, will assist people. They don't have to stand in these long lines. They don't have to go through the indignity of, of standing up in these lines, but they can apply online from the comfort of their home for assistance at social services. And even now we've digitized it to the point where you can get assistance through digital platforms and through digital wallets. So we've seen uh, hundreds of persons been able to get rent assistance and food assistance, not, not with a paper check, but right on their phone to be able to access those things. So we see click to clay and customs and you're going to be able to see very shortly an electronic online declaration form that the government is, in, is, is initiating through customs to where you can actually go ahead and fill out your customs declaration form even before you get home to the Providence or Freeport. But you're going to be able to apply uh, to uh, put it on and get and actually pay for your customs duty even before you get to Nassau. So there's a number of initiatives that uh, the government has, has been working on, finishing. We are looking to the future and some of the initiatives for the future, which we believe is again gonna revolutionize uh, what's happening in the Bahamas is our electronic ID. That is gonna be hugely important for us uh, with respect to ensuring that uh, all of our citizens can have one ID and that one ID is electronic, so it doesn't mean you're gonna have, you don't you don't have to have a passport or a driver's license or an NIB card, but you will have one electronic ID that you are able to access these services. And one that's important for me is our electronic cabinet. Uh, you know, when we came to office, we had to to have mounds and mounds of paper uh, in order to. Uh, have our cabinet papers and, and go through cabinet meetings. Now, every single cabinet minister, the only thing he brings to the cabinet meeting is his laptop, and we are able to access all of our cabinet papers online, securely online, and uh, uh, again, making the cabinet process more efficient. Uh, DigiPay was just launched. Again, our cashless initiative for our online services. We are soon... Persons are going to be able to pay for their government services using the central bank's sand dollar. So our government, our initiatives are wide. We are excited about it and we're just continuing to progress it. So, Senator, in actuality, what once would have taken us three to four weeks, we have to go and stand on the long line or you have to stand in a queue, can be literally done from the edifice of your home and you can have access to a myriad of things, whether it be police records, whether it be food stamps, it can all be done from the sanctity of your home because of technolo technological advances. Uh, am I right in that assertion? Absolutely. And again, what we are doing is really making the government work for the citizen instead of the citizen having to work for the government. And that really is a, is a switch in uh, mindset, is a, is a shift really in, in, in uh, government policy. And, uh, uh, and again, it's just about making things easier for the citizen. The citizen should not have to run from agency to agency to supply documents that the government already has access to. That's the government uh, in having the citizen work for it. We want to shift that. And we yeah. want to ensure that it is, this, it is the government now that is working for the citizen through the use of technology. Definitely. Now, I want to bring uh, Sharnet into this conversation because, of course, Sharnet is the Director of Business Solutions. Now, as it relates to business, Sharnet, um, tell me how does the digital transformation how does, what does that really mean for you in terms of today's business and today's leadership? So what we perceive digital transformation to mean for our customers is how can we better help customers and business leaders 
to embrace fixed mobile and cloud technologies that can help their businesses to remain viable. Whether that's how do they better engage customers, staff and suppliers if they can't come to the brick and mortar office? Does that mean they can place orders online and how do they follow through and navigate the logistics processes and update customers when something is out for delivery? How do they manage their inventory and also manage their suppliers, make sure that they're making payments to their suppliers in a timely manner so that they still have inventory and also receiving payments from customers so that they have that cash flow keep, to keep going? How do they adapt to the uh, flexible remote working environments and ensure that their, their staff can stay connected whether they're working from home, working from the field using a push to talk device or a mobile device that they, can, they might carry or tablets? And how do they keep people connected so that the, all of those processes work smoothly together? And then on top of that, they need to be able to manage and protect their data with cybersecurity tools to make sure that the wrong people aren't getting into their database and misusing their uh, customer data or misusing any data that's available to the company. I'm going to loop uh, Franklin Butler into this conversation. Mr. Butler, I'd like to ask this question. What other services will CBL Group of Companies offer within the next 20 years to remain in front of this innovation, in front of this technology? Thank you so much, Kandanik. Uh, uh, it's a pleasure to be here on this webinar today. You know, as I thought about this question, Kandanik, I think it's important to reflect about where we were 20 years ago. 20 years ago, I probably would have been in the UK and all of us generally would have had uh, a desktop somewhere in our house that was the one computer that could get on the internet. <laughs> we had cell phones, but we were predominantly using text message to communicate. And if we think about where we are now, <laughs> that is, I think, the sense of much of the frustration of many of our clients is the fact that connectivity is now requested anywhere, uh, however you want it, um, in a very liberal sense. Um, from a connectivity perspective. You go into a, a restaurant, you go into any office building, the first question you ask is, can I have the Wi-Fi password? And so I think access to connectivity is really where our focus is going to be as a group. And that no longer means that we are going to just provide access to the modem. We wanna think about it from a residential perspective around how do we make sure you have a seamless in-home experience? You know, How do we make sure you have you know, Wi-Fi connectivity, connectivity that's seamless in your bedroom, as it is, you know, in your kitchen, in your living room, which is where you predominantly function. And that is an area that much of our feedback and data has given us. As we look at our customer complaints of the onslaught of, of, of COVID-19, which created lockdowns and shutdowns, was that people expected to have connectivity everywhere. In addition to that, I think Seanette did a great job of explaining how we've been supporting the government and other of our enterprise clients around cybersecurity, around cloud and managed services. At the end of the day, people are no longer going to have domestic or, or what I call uh, individual servers, which have been networked by you know, some mainframe computer in a computer room in their organization. The expectation is that people want to be connected to the cloud and they want to have multiple uh, safe, secure access to connectivity so that when you're on your mobile phone or you're on your iPad or you're on your laptop, anywhere in the world, you can have access to your company's revenue numbers, access to cameras, and connectivity systems in a very safe and secure environment. So our focus at Cable Bahamas is really going to be around how do we provide these managed services to ensure that whether that's in your home or whether that's in business, you have access to the important data points that you need. So like Minister says, you wanna have access to a renewal passport and you're off in school in Ottawa. We wanna be able to assist the government and other clients to make sure that if you're in Ottawa, you can apply to renew your passport away from anywhere, anywhere in the world and that's done in a safe and secure manner, and you can be updated via text message, via um, some form of communication around how you how the progress of your application is going. And so we are we are all about enabling connected lifestyles and experiences, and we think that that is really what our focus is going to be over the next twenty years. Thank you so much. Uh, Damien, I'm going to rope you into this conversation. Now, Damien, of course, is our chief executive officer over at Alive. And Damien, this question is for you. As the world is evolving and becoming more tech reliant, how do you foresee be uh, business becoming more dependent on telecommunications or any related services as is assisted with business development? 
Okay, firstly, I'd like to just commend the minister. Um, I, I've been, I've seen at close quarters um, the minister's direct drive to um, bring that vision to life. I think, Minister, you were kind enough to invite me to some of the sessions with the Estonian delegation in 2018. Um, and I think it's amazing what you've achieved so far, um, that list of things, you know, since that, that visit, yeah, so, so congratulations. Um, I think I think I said this when the Estonians were here, Minister. Um, it feels like we're just getting used to e-government, e-commerce and e-everything. And of course, I'm going to move the cheese now and say, really, it's all about M-government, M-commerce and uh, M-everything else. Pretty much there's an app for everything nowadays is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is, 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 is the thing that you hear on your mobile phone. Almost everybody in the Bahamas, because of Alive's entry into the market five years ago, now has a smartphone of, of one form or another. And I, and I think that my big um, sort of call to action for businesses would be you have to think, and, 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 and businesses have had to think very hard about their M-commerce strategy in the last few, in the last few months and, and over the last year because of COVID, yeah. And I suppose some of us who evangelized the M vision um, before the COVID-19 happened were perhaps kind of a little bit of fringe lunatic, uh, 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 you know, people are seen like that. Well, no, not everything will happen off the mobile phone. And now, of course, here in the Bahamas, we see through COVID actually brand new businesses thriving, um, you know, the delivery businesses, and every business needs to think about how it interacts with its customers, its, its vendors and its suppliers using the smartphone. Even if you don't have an app, there are some incredible statistics out there. Alive's website is actually accessed 90% of the time from a mobile phone. And almost every website of a Bahamian business is being accessed from a mobile phone. So one of the things that we had to get our head around when we were redesigning our website recently was it's no longer looking at that website on a PC that's the primary thing to do. It's to actually view it over the mobile phone and make sure that it actually comes up correctly and is easy to use on all the forms of mobile phone. So there's a, there's a, a little bit of a tip for all businesses who are looking. They may already have a website, but is it mobile responsive? And that's a very simple check point to do. Is it easy to use? Is it easy to make a payment on a mobile phone? Um, payments are going to be crucial. Obviously, there's a big revolution starting to happen now with mobile wallets in the in the, in the uh, in the Bahamas, and I think that that will be crucial because as part of commerce, it's very important that you can pay. But I encourage all businesses, if you haven't already you must look at how you're interacting with your customers over smartphones and, and really look at the experience and, and kind of work it out and revolutionize your own business by, by looking at your business that way. Revolutionization is exactly what we need, Damien. And so with that question, uh, with that basic thought and that premise in mind, Minister, I'm going to pose this question to you. Does the government have any plans for building capacity in the areas of digitalization and technological advancement? What do you see the government doing in those particular arenas? Yeah, again, a very, very important question. And, and the answer is absolutely. It is absolutely critical that we uh, build uh, capacity uh, with respect to our digital transformation. In fact, a part of the uh, digital transformation project uh, from the IDB includes this whole question of upskilling. Uh, it includes the whole question of building uh, ICT capacity, um, not just in the private sector, but uh, generally and, and nationally. Um, one of the things that uh, we have been uh, extremely focused on is, and I know people ask this question, that if the government is moving towards its uh, digital transformation platform, then what happens to those employees, uh, or we, we make the processes more efficient, what happens to those employees? Well, one 
uh, answer to that is we need to continue to upskill, retool our employees and move them, not leave them behind, but move them along with the whole question of digital transformation. So we have an entire uh, sort of change management sector and that change management sector has been working with uh, agencies and working with employees of those agencies to help train them, uh, ensure that they are not left behind. Uh, Social services has done a wonderful job of training its employees to be able to use its platform and, uh, and then to assist persons to be able to use its platform. Education has done a wonderful job of training its teachers to be able to get and, and utilize the online uh, learning platform. And then in particular, we have uh, been focused on partnerships. So we've used uh, BTVI that you know that the government has recently uh, made, uh, made free for those who qualify. And we have connected BTVI with the uh, international tech giant Cisco. And they have done two things for us. One is they have helped us to put together a, a program for our high school students to ensure that our high school students are trained even before they graduate. So they are now receiving uh, their tech certifications even before they graduate school. Some with cybersecurity, software development, website design, uh, they are actually being trained from the ninth grade straight through until they reach the 12th grade and they're able to graduate. Uh, we also have connected with Cisco with a recent program to have 100 software developers trained. And, and I'm so pleased to be able to say that that's across the country because it's, it's uh, online training. So we have folks in Andrus and uh, the other family islands, Grand Bahama, Nassau, who are a part of this program. And what's key about this program is that those persons who complete, not only will they be certified in uh, software development through Cisco's DevNet, but it, they will then become qualified to get into Cisco's job program. And Cisco's job program offers them the ability to be employed from any company that has Cisco pro uh, uh, products throughout the world, and they can do it while they remain right here in the Bahamas. So that's new employment, that's new money, but at the same time, that's additional skills. And then we are focused on the uh, cybersecurity and the training with respect to cybersecurity. So absolutely, we're doing ICT building capacity with that. Now, Minister, you spoke about uh, ICT. Now, recently, Alive and Rev have partnered with Girls in ITC. And as you know, women account for 30% of persons that are involved in, in technology and in terms of uh, advancement. So would you say that this is an opportunity for us to utilize for our young girls that are coming up, that, that want to be involved in ITC, that want to be a part of technology? What would you say to that, Minister? I say absolutely. We encourage it. Um, we have to all also focus on uh, ICT with, uh, with girls. I mean, I think that's, again, an important initiative that uh, you are undertaking. And we also uh, can't forget our, our young men. No. And we also want to make sure that our young men also have those kinds of opportunities. We, uh, one of the initiatives that the, the Office of the Prime Minister in Grand Bahama was focused on uh, before uh, uh, COVID was we had a program partnering with the YMCA and the YMCA had an after school program and a Saturday program where they also were doing things like coding, uh, website design uh, for our, our young people to get involved in this. I tell young people all the time that if you think about it, every industry, there's one thing that every industry requires right now. That's an IT professional. And so no matter whether it's a law firm, whether it's a hospital, uh, whether, whether whatever company or industry it is, right now today, 
they require an IT specialist to, to, to manage their systems. And so that's one of the things I think that we have to continue to press, focus on. Uh, UB, even now, has been in, uh, in uh, expanding the use uh, with their respect to their IT projects. So they now have a new cybersecurity uh, degree that they are moving ahead with. BTVI has again been doing wonderful things and expanding what they're doing. But we need even more with respect to building capacity. Uh, you know, we, we, we talked about our Grand Bahama Tech Hub initiative, but a huge part of that Tech Hub initiative is creating the ecosystem for that Tech Hub. And part of that ecosystem has to be the building of human capacity in order for us to achieve that. Okay, thank you so much, Minister. Franklin, this question is for you. How is the digital transformation reshaping business and the way CBL groups of companies operate? Uh, great question. Thank you, Kandika. Um, one of the things I would say in terms of digital transformation is uh, a, a lot of digital transformation is really around managing and having uh, clear deliverables and expectations. I mean, I think the minister is alluding to it as he talks about uh, government processes, right? At the end of the day, if we don't know how many applications or widgets, if I could use it in this broad context of passports that need to be processed, it is very difficult for us to measure the efficiency and effectiveness of our organization. Digital transformation is allowing us in a very seamless way to measure that by using systems and technology to determine how effective we are. So for us, this is now no longer looking about who has the, what I call documented file, but looking into a computer system to understand how many applications, in our case, how many customer complaints, uh, or how many new installations or jobs we have, and being able to manage and measure and to provide a level of visibility for one, employees, but two, for the consumers as well. So how do we do that in a way which means you don't have to come into the physical office to determine, hey, did that file move from Mrs. Campbell's desk to Mr. Blackburn's desk? And so that is really what I think digital transformation is allowing us to do is to, to move files and to move processes along in a digital environment um, using computers and servers. And the way that we are going to do that is through cloud and making sure that we have what we call 365 applications like Microsoft Teams and otherwise, which allows us to collaborate in a way that means that we don't necessarily have to be in the office. So for example, today I'm on this call, I'm in Miami traveling and I have the ability to uh, still participate in my full workday in a digitally transformed environment. Probably a couple of months ago, if not a few years ago, I would say I was not available, I'm traveling, I'm unable to attend such a webinar because I had other commitments and we didn't think that we have the seamless applications like Zoom and Microsoft Teams to facilitate such a conversation. So what we are finding is that, again, access to information anywhere, uh, however we want it, is really what digital transformation is allowing us to um, um, proffer in terms of how we operate. And so what we are doing at KO Bahamas, again, Ken, Ken Bika, is really allowing many of our processes to be able to work that way. I mean, when, when COVID hit, we all moved out of our building in a space of one week, and we have allowed most of our employees, even today, to continue working from home. And again, we've seen productivity go through the roof, because what we have found is, generally, while there is a degree of tax, taxing part of working from home, when you have kids at home, we've seen schools begin to reopen. So we are seeing, you know, parents who uh, had the burden of managing kids and traveling to work finding that, hey, this is becoming a little bit more of a less stressful experience because there is an environment for the kids to work. I don't think we will go back to a full, um, what I call in-office work environments. We will probably continue to have a hybrid where we still think human interaction is extremely important because in order to build relationships and to develop trust, we still think that that is a very human experience. Even though we can do Zoom meetings, um, uh, we are going to have a combination of in-person and what we call remote digital digital uh, communication as a way of how we're going to operate from a KO Bahamas perspective. In terms of our customer experience, we are going to also try to continue the process of enabling our customers to have more access. Right now, you can pay online, you can pay via the live app. We are going to continue to allow greater processes, allow, if you, if you log a, a customer complaint, you'll be able to track that customer complaint through systems in very short order. In addition to that, 
we'll be launching a full launch of our fiber to the home program um, effective next, uh, next financial year, which will allow customers to have more capacity and access to data in a way that provides seamless uh, access to technology, in addition to launching Wi-Fi mesh programs, which will improve the in-home experience and really provide the level of service excellence that customers have come to expect from KO Bahamas Group. So this is what digital transformation is doing for us from an internal perspective and how we think digital transformation is going to impact our customers and our customer service moving forward um, as a result of COVID-19 and, and the general changes that have happened in our environment. Now, Franklin, you mentioned that productivity has gone through the roof. You also mentioned that because children have returned to school, it has given mothers, fathers, grandmothers, anyone that had to chip in an opportunity to definitely find their niche, be able to work around certain things and to be able to just pretty much maintain their, their sense of normal in terms of a work-life balance. I want you to talk to us just one more moment, if you would, please. Just a, a quick moment, if you would just give us this opportunity to, to tell me in terms of technological, technological advancement. Do you think that persons have taken proper advantage of the way that we can order grocery, we can order gas, we can learn online in terms of Google documents. Do you think that we've taken full advantage of that? Is there more potential for us to do more? Uh, Damien mentioned that this is a M universe and that things are really at the palm of our hands. Do you see a way for us to become more technology savvy? Absolutely. I think if we think about the Bahamas and just our response to COVID-19 and reflect about one year ago, we saw thousands, hundreds of people outside supermarkets waiting to, to, to provide grocery shopping. And that was an indication that we were not ready for a digital transformation. So I think that explains the opportunity that's in front of us. I think if we, you know, the minister has done an excellent job. You know, I have the privilege of serving uh, on the e-commerce advisory board. So much of what he describes that has already taken place in terms of passports and driver's license is the government's way of leading what I call government services into the digital economy. However, I still think that there is a huge opportunity for the private sector, grocery stores, gas stations, pharmacies, et cetera. We have seen what I would call an advent of what I call WhatsApp ordering is now working much more in our country. However, there needs to be a greater presence in particularly, you know, if I think about groceries, which I have uh, some interest in, um, we need to do more to make sure that there is a, a greater level of click to collect and click and deliver services uh, within groceries. And that is something that the private sector has to uh, come to terms with its own fears, its own um, lack of investment in digital transformation. I think there is still a expectation that when things go back to normal, that consumers want to go into stores to shop for these things. But I tell people all the time, we go on amazon.com, we go on walmart.com. And this is a norm. We, we, we've seen the, the advent of all of these ship to collect companies uh, you know, that you can you know, deliver to my address in Miami or Fort Lauderdale, whatever our favorite destination is, and, and ship it in in two or three days. And I think that is the opportunity for Bahamian businesses and much of our consumers to get on with the digital transformation agenda in the private sector. And as the minister knows, we, you know, the government has been working through the e-commerce advisory uh, committee, as well as the uh, economic recovery committee to look at how we partner with organizations like Etsy and other um, organizations to develop a Bahamian marketplace, which is still on the government's drawing board, to allow private sector trade to happen in a seamless way. But that is something that requires private sector leadership. And while the government is focused on trying to uh, uh, digitize its government services, uh, people like myself and others have to do more to make sure that there is a greater level of digital um, services available for what I call everyday services, groceries, pharmacies, food delivery, et cetera. And there have been some great examples. I think if you look at the Craven Apple we partnered with at Kale Bahamas Business Solutions, as well, if you look at uh, you know, some of the um, e-payment or mobile wallets, as Damon described, providers, there has been much progress made, but there's still a lot more uh, that I think can be done. I saw the launch of CrossRight.com, which is a wonderful initiative I saw the other day from a grocery retailer uh, at home. So I think the, it is happening. It's just not happened quick enough. And I think it is probably an indication of the lack of preparation of many of the Bahamian organizations around digital transformation before COVID. And now we are playing catch up in many uh, sectors and industries in our country in terms of how do we deal with digital transformation. 
Well, one thing I can say about the Bahamians is that we're very resilient. And if, it, if we're playing catch up, I think it's it's a process, but of course we'll get to that. And uh, this is gonna segue, segue my question for Charnette. Uh, Charnette, um, can you provide more detail about the introduction of the cloud services and other managed services? What will they look like in terms of cost uh, to the average business owner who has, who, who has his TIN number, who has his VIN? What will that look like to the average business person? So uh, thanks for that, Casey. What we're doing with business owners actually is customizing packages to suit their needs. So you could, uh, the, the beautiful thing about cloud and hosted solutions is it's not one size fits all. If you come to us as a small medium business and you just need you know, uh, one virtual machine and you need access to be able to have your details and data stored on, in our facility, with more focus for a small business, what we find is they want um, internet at their office and they want a number of mobile devices so that people can take orders and process orders or arrange collections, arrange delivery, those kinds of things. What we do find at the medium to larger scale in government businesses, of course, is that there, there is that need, as Franklin says, to virtualize. So there more aggressively trying to move from that brick and mortar environment from the physical servers that they've had for 10 and 20 years that need to be updated very regularly that need software patches that uh, people are not paying attention to which cause cybersecurity risk and those kinds of things so we are finding that the larger businesses are the ones that want to have their data stored in our national data center so data is stored in the bahamas uh, governed by Bahamas uh, rules and regulations, accessible only to that company, not accessible to anyone else. So it's secure, it's safe, and it's stored uh, securely in our facilities, but accessible to the management and the team from wherever they are, whether they're traveling to Miami like Franklin and want to access revenue reports and uh, process orders or, or whatever, or approve uh, payments, or the person who is processing the order with the customer and uh, managing what comes next and trying to keep the customer updated on what's happening. All of that should be accessible by any device, by any authorized person, regardless of wherever they are. And that's what the cloud can do for customers. So it facilitates things like uh, payments online and managing the inventory and the, the point of sale systems that need to be active for ongoing production, but it also facilitates off-site and off-island storage for those customers that are looking for it. So that if something happens to your brick and mortar building, you can continue operating your business from another location, just restart and, and get additional devices or connect from wherever you are, wherever your staff ends up being, connect back to the internet, connect to a point-to-point -point link to get access to that secure data and continue operating your business rather than waiting weeks or months for a new service to be installed physically and all the other delays that are associated with that. And Charnette, having that in the cloud, that means it's easily accessible morning, noon, or night. I don't have to wait from nine to five for regular business operations. I can do this at, at my will from the, okay. from the palm of my hand. Absolutely correct. So having it accessible in the cloud means it's accessible anytime by any authorized person on virtually any device, whether they're using an Apple or Android device, whether they're using a laptop and working from home, whether they're sitting in a brick and mortar office, whether they're a supplier or a, a person who is updating your files and they're doing that remotely from another country, that's also accessible. It means that it's a, a, a place that is secure, safe, and scalable so that as your business grows, the cloud infrastructure can grow with you. And it's not just limited to your data that's stored in the cloud. We have customers now looking to us for hosted PBX systems so that they can connect their workers anywhere. So whether the workers are sitting in the same office, in multiple offices, in the same island, multiple islands, or uh, they, they're moving about a lot, they can have mobile extensions so that they can connect and uh, stay connected as if they were all sitting in the same office, transfer calls, have conference calls, have video conference calls, and keep each other updated. 
and be able to escalate any things that are impacting uh, service or impacting revenue for the company. Now, Sharna, you know, sometimes we get a little bit offset by the matriculation of words and, and sometimes the words are too big for us. And so maybe we, we're not as tech savvy as we may need to be. So what you were saying is that I could be in Exuma and then I can have a coworker that's in Abu Dhabi or I can have a coworker that is in, 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 in Nigeria and we can all simultaneously work Absolutely. Get information access it in the cloud and we can work in tandem is talk to me Sharnet. Absolutely. is that what you're saying absolutely. that's absolutely correct and and uh using a couple examples of customers that have done that uh we do business and, and provide services for the kidney center and they have multiple offices throughout the country they use our services to connect between the nasa freeport abaco locations so it, it doesn't matter where the customer is if, if their patient is actually traveling they could still connect and be able to access services and the kidney center um, team can be able to access their data and be able to provide services for those customers regardless of wherever they, wherever they are. They can also have their uh, vendors and suppliers that are managing their data systems or their applications be able to update the applications remotely as well. So it doesn't require that everyone is sitting in the same office on the same island even you can be anywhere as long as you're authorized to access the data, uh, you're able to do that securely. Thank you so much, Charnette. And I want our attendees to please take an opportunity to complete the short poll. Alive is giving you a wonderful, wonderful gift. So please go ahead and make sure that you complete the short poll. This question that we have now is for Damien. Damien, I want you to tell us how has Alive or Cable Bahamas business solutions tapped into data mining and data science? If so, is it assisting with business growth? And if not, will it? Yeah, I mean, we, we've embraced the big data agenda in Alive from the very beginning. So we, we, we have sophisticated um, MIS uh, warehouses or, 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 or where we capture certain data. Um, that assists us with understanding our customers, how they use the phone, um, what kinds of things they're doing in terms of how much data, how much, how many, how many calls they're making. This is all kind of anonymized, um, so that you know it's when we're looking at it without um, reference to the to the customers. It's all stored safely here in, in Cable Bahamas uh, National Data Center. Um, uh, we don't we don't send the data anywhere. And we do use it to, to when we're designing new products, for example. So if we're designing new pricing or plans, obviously we, we look to see what might be attractive to, to customers. And we've refreshed our prices and our, uh, uh, on a few occasions and our promotions are, are refreshed almost on a monthly basis. And we're using a lot of mining of that data to understand what might appeal to customers in terms of value um, to them. Um, so that's kind of a, a big, a big area. We we have an Alive Creates program, where we uh, we, we designed a, 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 a number of app based solutions. The the, the, the biggest one I think uh, that people will recognise is the List, which is a loyalty scheme for Alive customers that involves lots of local businesses being given the platform to give offers. Um, that they want to give to Alive's customers. And um, obviously there's data also available that we capture from that, which helps the businesses themselves to structure their discounts and their offers in, a, in an intelligent way. So they, they kind of see which, which offers uh, are, are good for their, are good at attracting more business to them um, on the list. And, 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 and uh, you know, there's kind of a bit of a trial and error with that kind of thing to work out what are the things that work and what don't. And we share that data with the businesses. So there's a couple of examples and many, many others. Um, telecoms and uh, particularly mobile has grown up in this, in this big data world uh, from the very beginning. Um, you know, the big data world is kind of, a lot of people think when they talk about that, uh, social media companies, but actually mobile telecoms in particular 
has actually had it at the heart of everything it does throughout my entire career. Um, long before uh, the, those companies came on the scene, there's always been an aspect of using the data to understand customer need and then and then tailor the promotions. So it will evolve. Um, and there's obviously questions of of privacy and, and things like that that the uh, that's that's all societies around the world are working through. Um, and, and as I say, we do it in a in a way that is making sure all the data is safe and anonymized when we when we are looking at it in a live. Uh, we've we've kind of adopted a very conservative approach to how we do that. Okay, uh, Damien, I have another question for you, please. Um, how is digitization going to impact the standard way of sales of products under the telecoms within the next 10 years? In-store sales, brick and mortar. Uh, you spoke about privatization uh, in terms of privacy for persons that want to use technology. Tell me what you think about, uh, about the standard way of, of sales and products under telecoms within the next 10 years. What do, you, what do you think is going to happen? I think that telecoms will be the same as every other business, quite frankly, in the next, it's already happening on a big scale. So if you go to, if you, if you go to, the, to the US and you try and order Apple products nowadays, you pretty much point to the Apple website and then you click and collect is, is the general way. You can, you can also have it delivered, yeah. But the Apple of, 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 of almost funneling customers down now, please order in advance and pick up at the store or, 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 or now Apple can do that because people who buy Apple products generally have a lot of familiarity, familiarity with Apple products. They don't need to touch and feel them before they, before they, they do it. But I think that all businesses, as Franklin alluded to, will, will need to get into click and collect or click and deliver. Um, and again, I reiterate that experience needs to be seamless from a mobile phone. Because most of that, those uh, transactions are now happening over a mobile phone. So I, th I see that as a big thing. And the, the other thing I would just make, just stepping out of the question slightly, but it make a, a slightly different point. The world has, the way, this, this is a change to the way the whole world will work. You see a lot of announcements from very large global companies now where they're going to allow people who are employed by them to work from anywhere. This is a huge opportunity for Bahamians, particularly young Bahamians with the new skills. So the kind of skills that um, the minister mentioned, which um, BTVI, who's been a partner of Alive for five years, um, we've, we've always worked with them, the Cisco skills, for example. There is no reason whatsoever anymore why Cisco engineers trained here in the Bahamas can't be working on global projects with global companies. It, and, and I think that you're going to see the dismantling rapidly in the next five to 10 years of what we think a company is. I remember somebody painting a vision about 20 years ago, a, a lecture I saw that effectively companies will be a series of independent collaborators. You won't really have employees anymore. It'll be people who come together to do some things. And I think, we're, we're now seeing the vision come alive, alive, yeah, um, alive, to pardon the pun. And I think that I, I, I would sort of call all Bahamians, particularly young Bahamians, to look at those opportunities. Here's your chances coming in the next five to 10 years. Because you can work from these beautiful islands, um, there's, there's no barrier anymore to doing some amazing jobs once you've got the right skills and trained. So everybody needs to look at their own skill bank and training and make sure that you know that, that they've got the right skills for these opportunities but, but i do believe there's going to be huge opportunities thank you so much damien um we are almost to that hour of 1 p.m the minister has to leave to go to another uh, engagement but we want minister for you to please answer these last two questions if you can for us because we know that you have to leave promptly at 1 p.m so these are our last two questions for you to close out, Minister. Um, this one is from Patrice Ingram. And the question is, what is the government strategy for mitigating the risk associated with technological advancement, i.e. cyber attacks, et cetera? And when you're done with that question, I have another one for you as well, Minister. So that is a, a hugely important question. Um, because for 
the, and, and everybody knows that the more active you become with uh, uh, the computer, internet, uh, digitization, uh, the more vulnerable you really become uh, when it comes to uh, cyber attacks. And the government itself has uh, has experienced this. Um, we've seen issues that we've had at the Registrar General's office, um, ZNES, uh, even the, the, the public treasury. Um, uh, and so uh, we recognize that uh, you have to do both at the same time. You have to move ahead with your digital transformation, but at the same time, you must ensure that your cybersecurity is also um, enhanced at the same time. So one of the things that we have uh, have done is we have uh, gotten into a partnership with uh, the ITU, um, the uh, which is the United Nations uh, Techn- Technology Arm or the United Nations ICT Arm. And they actually are the ones who go from country to country and uh, assess how countries are doing uh, with respect to cybersecurity. And admittedly, we are not doing that well um, uh, at present, but we are focused on ensuring that we are beefing up our cybersecurity. So what we have done is entered into a partnership with the ITU and the ITU are, are, are gonna do a couple of things for us. First of all, they're gonna do a national assessment and that national assessment has started. They are working on the national assessment right now as we speak. Uh, which will tell not just from a government standpoint, but but it will tell from a a private sector standpoint, how are we doing with respect to cybersecurity? And what do we need to do in order to continue to protect ourselves? Where are our vulnerabilities? Uh, Are our banks vulnerable? Is our healthcare? What about our uh, electricity supply? Uh, All of these things that rely on a, a digital platform uh, to op- to operate, uh, how vulnerable are we? So uh, the ITU is presently doing a national assessment for us. But also what they're going to be doing is drafting for us a national policy and strategy on how we enhance our uh, cybersecurity. They will also be assisting us with putting together the necessary legislation in order for us to beef up cybercrime. Um, you know, that's a, a huge, again, uh, issue with, yes, uh, I, I'm, I'm going to protect myself, but what happens to the, to the person who is actually performing these cyber crimes against uh, the citizens? So we need to ensure that our laws are brought up to date, and they are also going to be working with us on that as well. And then what is going to be even more important than all of those things is the creation of a CERT, uh, which is the uh, Cybersecurity uh, Emergency Response Team. And they are now going to be a critical part of protecting the government's infrastructure. Right now, we work with uh, one of, uh, we have a number of persons who work in our DTU and our DTAD, and they work along with the police. But, but what we are going to do is to put in place, uh, uh, designed and assisted by the ITU, a CERT, which is that cybersecurity team that's going to do a couple of things. They are going to monitor our systems. Uh, they are going to uh, analyze the, uh, the, the threat, if any, and then they are going to be able to respond to uh, the threat. Uh, and so uh, we think within the next uh, 12, uh, 12 months, that CERT will, will be completed. We have already uh, started the process of recruiting uh, persons uh, to fill these spots. Uh, so you'll see some ads that have already gone out where we want to employ cybersecurity experts uh, to, be a, to be the first persons to uh, form this CERT. So we recognize that this is a huge need it is something that we have to continue to work on, and the government is pushing forward with it. Minister Thompson, we are at 1257. Do you have time for one final question? Sure, sure, sure. All right. Thank you so much. 
All right, this is our final question. And then of course, we will thank everyone for coming out this afternoon. It's been a wonderful group of, the, a group of, of persons on our panel so that we can have this thought provoking conversation. So Minister Thompson, focusing on the future, what role will digitalization and technology advancement play in the government's plan towards economic recovery, especially because that is so paramount right now for us here in New Providence and of course, GBI? So one of the first things I'd say to answer that question is jobs, 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 jobs. Yes. Um, I think, I think uh, uh, Damien hit it really right on the, on the nail, which is if we want to, to uh, stimulate economic growth, we have to begin to look at things differently. We have to, there's, there's no longer, you're no longer limited to these brick and mortar uh, employment opportunities. But we now need to start to train our uh, our citizens to be able to take advantage of global uh, employment opportunities, and that is the the, the whole point of behind the training with Cisco, and uh, uh, being able to connect with Cisco. We also think that there's there's um, uh, some additional uh, opportunities with respect to the cybersecurity industry, with respect to software development industry. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's not just about, you know, when we started our initiative, we started our initiative thinking about how can we attract tech companies to come to the Bahamas and then employ uh, Bahamians uh, while they're in the Bahamas. But, you know, as we go through and, and as we go through this process, we recognize that, you know, you don't have to have uh, a tech company that, that builds a brick and mortar building in the Bahamas in order for Bahamians to be able to take advantage of this industry. And, and, you know, one of the things that one of the Cisco vice presidents said to us when he came was, this was that this Bahamas has a wonderful opportunity for, to, be, to create a software development industry, that we have the proximity, we have the, uh, the, the, the speak, we speak the language, uh, we have the, the uh, capacity, the intelligence, uh, our people are able to, to to be trained in order to take advantage of this, and uh, person places like India and South America that now have a a vibrant uh, uh, you know uh, industry, we are closer, and we have more connection with places like the United States, so we can take full advantage of those kinds of things. What I also want to say is one of the studies that we've been looking at, Ministry of Finance has been looking at also, is this whole question about retooling. And businesses being able to retool. In fact, they have evidence that shows that those countries that invest in retooling their employees uh, also increase economic growth uh, through this whole retooling development. So one of the things that the, the government has to now be focusing on is how do we help businesses? How do we give them, how do we incentivize those businesses to retool those employees to become more efficient? And if they become more efficient, more effective, then their businesses can expand at the same time. Another aspect that we want to focus on is this, again, the whole question of electronic ID. And again, the studies show that those, comp those uh, countries that have been able to advance and put in place an electronic ID, that their revenue has gone up, again, because of the efficiencies that uh, is created as a result of having an uh, electronic ID, as well as it, it's very effective when it comes to taxation at the same time. Um, and so those are the kinds of initiatives I think that we have to continue to push towards when it comes to our uh, economic recovery. But our focus really has been on uh, providing and creating opportunities for those Bahamians for ownership. And again, it provides a wonderful opportunity. I've seen it in the last few years where young people have been courageous enough to have their own startup businesses through these di different technologies. How many website development companies that we've seen being developed? How many software development companies we've seen being, being uh, put together? And because of this whole question of digitization, the whole question of businesses being able to uh, uh, expand and do their, their, their digital transformation, it now provides opportunities. It now provides things like cybersecurity jobs, 
software development jobs, website development jobs, da uh, data analytic jobs. So all of those things it now is able to provide and when it comes to expanding our economic growth. So I'm excited. It's something I believe that the, the Bahamas has only touched uh, when it comes to its potential um, uh, for economic growth and its potential. I'm excited about what we could do in Grand Bahama uh, with respect to our Grand Bahama Tech Initiative and doing all of these wonderful things that again will expand uh, our economic growth and expand and help our economic recovery. Minister, thank you. It has been an indeed a pleasure with having you here with us this afternoon. Again, if you want to reach out to us, you can reach out to us at better, sorry, at business solutions at cablebahamas.com or you can call us directly at 242-601-8911 in Nassau or 242-602-8811 in the family of islands. Uh, I want to give everyone an opportunity to close out. And so we'll give each person 30 seconds. And so uh, we will close out uh, with Minister, of course, you've, you've had your final say. Uh, Franklin, can you give us a 30 second um, sure. sign out? Sure, sure, Kandika. First of all, I just want to thank everybody for participating, particularly the Minister. And just to say that this whole idea of digitization and the digital economy is one that we all have to take personal responsibility. We believe at Kale Bahamas that we're well positioned to help our clients. And we are here to partner as we have with the government and supporting the government initiatives. We are prepared to partner with many of our clients to make sure that this idea of cybersecurity, digitization, and this whole idea of uh, leveraging technology uh, is at the forefront of everything that we do. And as we've demonstrated through Hurricane Dorian, through COVID-19, and all the wonderful things we've done between Rev and Alive, we are committed to making sure the Bahamas is the leader in the Caribbean and that we do all we can to assist our clients in driving digital transformation. I must say that we cannot leave it to the government alone or even to KO Bahamas alone. This is a journey that each of us as uh, business people and as the private sector must partner with the government and other stakeholders on. And we will be doing all we can to make sure that. And so if anybody has any questions, I make myself available to speak with clients as well as any uh, interested persons who uh, wanna understand how to start a digital journey uh, in the Bahamas from a business perspective. So thank you very much, Kendika. Thank you so much, Franklin. Damien, we can have a word from you, please. Unmute yourself, Damien, sorry. So I'd like to thank Franklin. I think Franklin called, you know, set forth a vision in Cable Bahamas um, a few years ago to connect lifestyles with, you know, the digi digitization and, and, and we've been working on various missions to do that. This year, the mission was to to really lead the Bahamas digital transformation, and I think we you know, we you, you've done a great job, Franklin, of doing that. And 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 I think it's 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 you know it was a brave vision, and it was a brave mission this year, particularly with everything that's gone on with COVID. Um, the minister's done a fantastic job, as I praised him earlier, in the government sphere, and I think Franklin, you know, you're leading the charge in the in, in the private sector sphere, and, and, and I think you should be commended for that. Just remember, as, as we do it, um, my little reminder that it's a mobile world now. And, um, you know, we're not, we're no longer chained to the desks or looking for that desktop machine that you gave us the vision of at the beginning, Franklin. And um, that, that's the thing for all the businesses and, and, and individuals to remember. And it is a mobile world in terms of the fact that we can collaborate with anybody around the globe now. Some of the kind of localized thinking that maybe we had in the past is going to disappear fast. And 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 and, and all Bahamians need to embrace that change at, at speed. I think. Thank you so much, Damien. Charnette, we'll hear the closing remarks from you, please. Thanks for that, Kendika. So um, Minister also alluded to before about ICT becoming the third part, third pillar of the economy in the Bahamas. And we're doing our part as Cable Bahamas Business Solutions and our team of trailblazers working with business leaders in both the public and the private sector to co-create, deliver and support technology solutions that drive that digital transformation. So whether it's fiber services for physical connectivity to an office or a complex 
um, mobile and LTE solutions via Lives National Network, whether that's mobile phones or IoT kind of solutions for connecting devices, cloud solutions via our national data centers with options for off-island storage in Canada, if that's required. And it's also great to note uh, Mr. Thompson's comments about a BTVI, a Cisco DevNet, and the UB cybersecurity programs that are preparing students to take advantage of opportunities in IT, ICT in this arena as they present themselves. So to start on the ground level as an IT specialist or a cybersecurity specialist and work your way up in IT and the mobile world, because it provides lots of growth and opportunities for career growth whether that's uh, for the girls in ICT and guys in ICT, anyone interested in getting into this field, it's, it's a great opportunity. I, I wonder, Kindi, if I can just also, I uh, wanted to have an opportunity to thank you and to thank um, uh, Cable Bahamas and Alive um, for participating and, and uh, allowing me to participate um, in this uh, webinar. I think it was hugely successful. Um, and a great real opportunity to talk about uh, uh, this, uh, which which is a very very important topic for uh, for the government. But I also wanted to thank you, um, uh, Damien, as well as uh, Franklin um, and and Charnette, who we've worked with for your partnership. Um, you know, one of the things that I I didn't mention, but I wanted to highlight was the uh, the partnership that we we've, we've had, uh, in particular with the call center. Uh, you know, the, the my pilot um, uses Cable Bahamas as a call center, and that is sort of just as just an example of the kinds of partnerships that we need to have uh, with government and private sector in building this industry. So I want to thank you for putting this on. Thank you for allowing me to uh, participate, um, and uh, uh, we'll we want to continue to build on the uh, partnership that we've started. Thank you so much, Minister. On behalf of Cable Bahamas Business Solutions and the Alive team, we believe in best. We want to thank you and express our thanks and gratitude for having the Minister be a part of this very important discussion. Again, thank you and have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you to our attendees for coming out and taking the time to participate in this conversation. Have a good afternoon, everyone. Thank you.